As we finish up our Thanksgiving week, I had realized that I have been more thankful than in years past. And in this year of all years, it's because I had to rely on God that much more this past year. COVID and other things as well. And I'm sure I'm not alone. And reach down and really get more faith. Trials turn us to God. And Jesus is still the one who can provide us with that peace that surpasses all understanding to those who turn their hearts to him and trust in him with faith. So the theme, I guess, of our message today is going to be God's greatest joy. God never gives up on those who have a heart for him. Last month, we enjoyed a short midweek Bible series that centered on Jesus' kingdom parables. And they're the part of the 40 or so parables that Jesus began to teach in the latter part of his Galilean ministry. And today we're going to work our way through the 15th chapter of Luke. And we will delve into a very familiar parable. You know it as the prodigal son. And since Jesus relates this parable as the third story in a trilogy of parables, we'll look at them all together as the Lord intended. But first, we need to recognize just what a parable is and why Jesus used it. Did you know the parables make up about a third of Jesus' teachings? Because you see, in the Jewish culture, they used word pictures to explain things much of the time. So Jesus began to teach in picture stories to convey his spiritual concepts so that those with ears to hear would understand it and more importantly, put it into practice in their lives. In the basic sense, the word parable in the Greek means to set beside. So Jesus would take a commonly familiar idea, a person, place, a thing, culture, and he would set up beside an unfamiliar idea to draw a comparison or an analogy. And then the unfamiliar ideas then become the spiritual points that develop into the lessons of the parable. And our Lord was the master storyteller and brilliant teacher using simple word pictures to explain his most profound spiritual lessons. But why did Jesus begin teaching only in parables? Because we know that our Lord did not always teach in parables. For instance, the Sermon on the Mount covering three full chapters is the longest uninterrupted record of Jesus' words in the Bible. And it is a perfect model of how Jesus did teach in straightforward language. But as the Jews' resentment and rejection of Jesus intensified, and as they conspired to kill him, Jesus suddenly shifted to his parabolic teaching, directing his messages now away from those with the hardened hearts and to those who had the ears to hear. In Matthew 13, his disciples, noticing this, asked him a question. Lord, why do you teach to them in parables? And Jesus tells them, because it has been given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. You see, Jesus always speaks to the hearts and the minds of those who are open to him. But to the prideful and self-sufficient, well, they end up becoming the perplexed because they don't get it and they don't understand. God says in Jeremiah, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. So I'll just ask as we begin our study, let's take a moment. Let's ask ourselves, what is the condition of my heart currently? And if you test your mind, what portion of it loves and relates to God? 
This parable of the prodigal son is widely recognizable, even by those who are unfamiliar with the Bible. But there are many elements to it that are easily missed if we simply just read the story. However, when we take the time to study it in all its context, and when we search for the lessons, and when we engage our minds, now that's when we can understand it at such a much deeper level. And I want to emphasize a minute or two the, the importance of this. Back in the Old Testament, way back in the book of Deuteronomy, God revealed his greatest commandment. God says, hear this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds and use them as reminders. Reminders. Friends, we are living in turbulent and perilous times. And this upside down secular world wants to tell us that we don't need God. But we know we do need him. And the world needs him now more than ever. We need the reminders of what God says and what God wants for our lives. And he has not forgotten you. You are not a casual idea in the mind of God. And God doesn't want to be a casual thought in your mind either. Now fast forward some 1400 years after Deuteronomy to Jesus. And as our Lord so often did, he quotes the Old Testament scripture. And here is what he said. In Matthew 22, Jesus has asked the question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus repeats the Father's command. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then Jesus adds this, and with all your mind. Folks, God wants us to use our minds, our intellects, to get to know him better. So when we come to his word, we bring our hearts, yes, but we also bring our minds and we study. That's why they make study Bibles. The Bible is the most important life instruction book ever written and how it is so relevant today. Still, more. Did you know that there was a time when the Bible was the main textbook for public school students? Did you know that there are more than a thousand biblical references in the works of Shakespeare? Our past literary geniuses no less than Ralph Waldo Emerson and Charles Dickens both cited the parable of the prodigal son as, quote, the greatest short story ever written. Now, some of you are sitting there and you're thinking, the greatest short story ever written? Is there something about the story that I've missed? Oh, well, maybe there is. And it's my hope and prayer that you too will find this a captivating revelation into the heart and mind of our Lord. So if you haven't already, if you'd open your Bibles to Luke 15, this enlightening chapter, this will be our study. In this one chapter, we will experience repentance, mercy, and forgiveness, but we will also see hypocrisy, pride, and self-indulgence, shame, but great honor we're going to observe what true patience is really like in the face of immature impatience. We will witness wastefulness, and that's just what the term prodigal means, squandering and wasteful. You will recognize the gift of independent free will with the resulting consequences of choice. And then it comes a personal awakening out of sheer desperation, but leading to repentance, and repentance leading to reconciliation, which leads to restoration, a full restoration with God. And finally, transcending above all else, there's a triumphant celebration of joy and the ultimate display of the most amazing grace ever imaginable, all presented to us by the greatest storyteller that ever walked the earth our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 15 really does cover a lot. 
But as the chapter unfolds, go back to our theme and keep this in mind. God never gives up on those who have a heart for him because his greatest joy is in the recovery of the lost. The Bible tells us the Lord your God is in your midst. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. He will exult over you with loud singing. Now we don't first think of God as shouting and singing with joy. But as we increase in our knowledge of God, we will find that everything he does is meant to bring him glory and to bring him joy. The 18th century theologian Jonathan Edwards said it this way, God's single end in redemption is his own joy. Friends, make no mistake, our Heavenly Father has a compelling interest in the recovery of the lost for his own joy. On the contrary, God has no joy in the death of unrepentant people. The last verse of Ezekiel 18, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. And he says four more words in that verse. So turn and live. You'll find that Jesus' parables always turn to the gospel, stories of salvation. And we are about to see the Father's joy when just one sinner seeks forgiveness. That is what this chapter is about, redemption and joy. And Jesus starts, off, starts us off at the end of chapter 14 when he repeats a warning that he proclaimed over and over when he taught his parables. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning, if your heart is soft for God and you set your mind on him, your ears will be opened and the Holy Spirit of God will give you understanding. Now for the setting. Who are Jesus' hearers? Chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors, oh boy, and the sinners were all coming near him to listen to him. All the sinners, all the outcasts, these individuals were detested as the lowest of the low by the Jewish elite, socially, culturally, and religiously. The worst of the worst kinds of people. But these people were eager to hear what Jesus was going to teach them because you see, they had heard Jesus before and they had heard just enough to know that they wanted to hear more. This was one set of listeners. Another set of hearers are mentioned in the next verse. The Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, to murmur greatly. This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Because these were the hard-hearted, self-appointed agents of God, there to represent the virtues of God to the whole world. And they were certain that God, too, had nothing but utter disdain for these sinners. They would not be polluted by any association with sinners, not to mention the shame of actually dining with them. But the whole world is made up of sinners, yes? They just didn't recognize themselves as sinners. And so it is the words sin and sinner do not sit well with some people even today, do they? Yet here is Jesus in their midst, humbly doing the work of the Father, redeeming sinners, the ones who recognize themselves as sinners. This other group, they do not grasp just how far from God they are like many today. They don't really know God. They think that being a good person is good enough. Proud of who they are, they don't yet see their need for God. But well, Proverbs tells us that it's the humble who receive God's favor. We heard last week 
from John James 4, 6, says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So it was their prideful hypocrisy. It was the premise behind their scornful statement that this man welcomes sinners that prompted Jesus to respond. And he responds in a very effective way. He tells them three parables in sequence. Verses 3 to 6. He begins with a man who had lost a sheep and had sought to find it. And when he finds it, he gathers his friends and he has a celebration. And Jesus clarifies his spiritual lesson and instructs them. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And who do you think Jesus was referring to by the 99 righteous persons? The Bible tells us that no one is righteous, right? But these scoffers were indeed righteous in their own eyes, in their own mind. And Jesus is saying to them, do you hear what I'm saying to you? The Father has more joy when just one outcast sinner repents than all of you self-righteous people who think you need no repentance. Then Jesus tells them a second story to emphasize the point. In verse 8, a woman has 10 silver coins. Perhaps it's her invested savings or maybe her valuable bridal necklace. But she loses one of those valuable coins. And when she finds it, she rejoices. I found my coin. And she calls out to all her friends and her neighbors and she breaks out the celebration. Again, the spiritual application comes. In verse 10, Jesus tries again to get them to understand. He says, just so, just like that, I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And who would be the joyful one in the midst of the angels? It's God. And he doesn't wait for 10,000 sinners to start the party, or 1,000, or 10. The celebration in heaven goes on when just one sinner turns to Jesus. And our Lord is basically saying, you arrogant fools, you would go to a party for the return of a lost animal or a found coin, but not celebrate the restoration of an eternal soul. How far are you from the nature of God? And now... Jesus speaks a third parable to them. And what a story it is. Fasten your seatbelts. And to fully grasp the magnitude of this story, we place ourselves into the Middle Eastern Jewish culture, a culture dictated by a certain continuum, an embedded scale that would weigh honor on one side and shame on the other. Because everything related to whether you brought honor or shame to yourself and your family. So Jesus takes this, this strongly observed custom, which by the way, this is the familiar idea of the parable, this culture of shame and honor. And he creates this fascinating, shocking story that from start to finish is so counterintuitive to the Pharisees' superficial thinking that it sends their eternal internal shame meter right through the roof. One part of it after another. They can't believe it. Verse 11, Jesus begins. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. Now right away, the Pharisees were repulsed. Wait, what? He's out of line. He is out of rank. He is the younger son. And what's this? He wishes his father to be dead? You see, the estate would not be settled until the father passed away. And this son is not asking for his share so that he can begin to manage affairs or take on more responsibility for the family. This boy wants nothing to do with the father. He obviously resents the father. 
He wants his money. He wants it now, and he wants out. Now that is the shame of all shames for a Jewish son, for any son to feel that way about his father. But his desire for freedom and independence and self-indulgence takes over his sensibilities. He wants no accountability, no restraints. In essence, he wants no more of his father. So not only does this son break Jewish family law, he violates God's command to honor your parents. So at this point, the Pharisees are expecting Jesus to follow up with something like this. Then the father yanks the boy in by the robe and begins to beat him publicly. The father must protect his honor with this disrespectful son. He cannot go unpunished. End of verse 12, we see the father does not react that way. It says he divided his property between them. So you have the shameful son, and now you have a shameful father. Because the Pharisees and scribes are thinking to themselves, no respectful Jewish son would so hate his father, and no honorable father would pander to his son in such a shameful way. And they also would bring the older son into question because he had the duty of protecting the father's honor and the duty of protecting the younger son from doing foolish things. So even the older brother now appears shameful already. <laughs> it gets worse. Verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he journeyed into a far country. And there he squandered his estate in reckless and loose living. He acts quickly and liquidates his portion for cash. You see, an early distribution like this would have had to have been in the form of a title deed of certain assets, maybe animals or land of the father's estate. And the father would remain there and continue to receive the benefits of the estate for as long as he lived. So the son was basically selling a future something whose worth could not be realized until sometime in the unforeseen future. And how do you liquidate something like that so quickly? Well, obviously the son had to sell it at a what? At a discount. So here's even more shame. He trivializes his family's value by turning the property over to some discount buyer who's going to take over and break up the family's estate when the father passes away. So not only is this son shameful, but he also shows how impatiently foolish he is because he sacrifices his future and the future of his family at the altar of the immediate. He takes off to go live irresponsibly and immorally. And we know this because in verse 30, the elder son, when he's scolding his father, says, this son of yours who's devoured your property with prostitutes. The shame mounts, and the plot thickens. Verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. How much need? Well, we know if we check historically, when a severe famine arose, people became so desperate they would eat garbage dead animals, and even the leather from their own sandals. So this new life that this young man chose, which he took control of, his choice was now completely out of control. Verse 15. He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Literally, it means that he attached himself. This indicates that he became a beggar. And verse 16 tells us that no one gave him anything. So this was not a job. The man he attached himself to more than likely just wanted to get rid of him. So he sends him into the field and he ends up defiling himself with unclean swine. And worse, it says he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. 
You see, pigs were fed carob tree pods, with their, which are undigestible to humans. So the only reason he didn't eat the same slop as the pigs is because literally he could not. This boy is desperate and starving. What is this? Who is this? Jesus has just presented the most desperate, degenerate sinner imaginable to his listeners. Broken and hopeless and going lower and lower. This is a picture of the condition of a lost sinner or even a rebellious Christian who rejects the Father's will. It's been said that sin always promises more than it gives takes you farther than you wanted to go and leaves you worse off than you were before. Sin promised freedom but delivered this boy into slavery. Here is the gift of free will in action and here is the resulting consequences of the young man's choices. And we saw that the loving father allowed his son to choose. We saw that the father let him have his rebellious request. But what didn't we see? We did not see the father chase him down when he turned away in defiance. Because God gives us the freedom to choose our sin. And we can take it into any direction and to any extent we wish to take it. Now this image that Jesus paints here is extreme, no question. But separation from God is inevitable. There are many ways that we can separate ourselves from the goodness of our God. And it's inevitable for every person until he or she recognizes Jesus for who he is. Humbly coming to their senses and turning back to the Father in repentance. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough to eat? But I am dying here with hunger. When he came to his senses, this pivotal verse changes the direction of the story. Finally, the sinner looks inward and takes an honest assessment of his own situation. And where does true reconciliation begin? It begins with the change of the mind and a change of your heart. So now the son thinks about his father and his goodness. And he thinks about the life he was given with him. And he thinks about all the blessings of his future life with his father. He contrasts himself now, an unpaid slave to a Gentile, to his father's well cared for servants. You see, the hired men, they were day laborers, the lowest on the socioeconomic scale. And even they, because they trusted the father, were well taken care of. This son at last realizes the goodness and the generosity of the father and he remembers how fair and kind his father is and he finally sees his father for who he really is to him and he wants to go back he is embarrassed he's ashamed but he's honest with himself maybe for the first time in a long time and he begins to contemplate his very hard and difficult reunion that he hopefully will have with his father. Verses 18 and 19. He begins to rehearse what he's going to say when he gets the opportunity with his father. He says to himself, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me as one of your hired servants. Now don't miss this. 
may not seem like he's truly repentant. But this young man is releasing his rights as his father's son to take on the position of the lowest of servants. And he understands the magnitude of his sin because he says, Father, I have sinned against you and God. He is not looking to reclaim his previous privileges, but just to be received back as one of his father's hired servants. I will say this is a true heart change and a humble conversion. God lets us choose and go our own way, and he does not impose his will upon us, but he does allow us to suffer the consequences of our own will. But you know what else? And this is the best news. It's our theme. God never gives up on those who have a heart for him. He knows the hearts out there. Remember, God's greatest joy is in the return of the lost. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. So what do you think he was expecting to get when he saw his father? Rejection? Because after he took the money and ran off, there would have been a funeral. He may be thinking his father is going to say, you're no son of mine, you are dead to me. Or maybe a public beating in front of the whole village. He's at least expecting hard labor for sure. But verse 20 continues. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt, felt what? Felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. There is so much here. And the details are important. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His son wasn't even at the village yet. And his father saw him. Why? Because his father was waiting and seeking for him to have this change of heart. And he felt compassion, not disdain. What could possibly be next? Well, I'll tell you what's next. There was nothing else on this father's mind in this moment, and he could not contain his joy. And he does something unthinkable. It says he ran. Middle Eastern noble men did not run. They wore robes. And robes were a sign of honor and dignity. And the robes went all the way to the ground so you couldn't see their legs. To pull up his robe and run through the village would be such a shameful scene. But the father, again, has one thing on his mind. To get to his son before the scoffers do. To get to the son before the townspeople do. And he runs to get to his child to absorb his shame. And then he embraced him. This pig stinking rebel. Now that's, that's real reconciliation. And not only that, he kissed him. The original text says the father kissed him repeatedly. Covering the head with kisses was an expression of great love. And the word run in the Greek means sprinting, like in a race. The father sees the child returning and he sprints down the middle of town to receive him. And he embraces him. We can just see the father throwing his arms around his boy, literally lifting him up off the ground and kissing him. And with tears of joy, my son, my son, you have come home to me. I love you so much, my child. The father took the scorn. No shame for this boy. He should have been beaten. That's what he deserved. So what just happened? What is this? I'll tell you what it is in one word. Grace. It's grace. It's the undeserved, unmerited, amazing grace of our Heavenly Father. The Pharisees didn't get it. They couldn't get it. You know why? Because they had no category for grace. Their minds are stuck back in verse 2. They began to grumble because this man receives sinners. Now verse 21. Under this overwhelming act of grace, the son speaks. Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But he stops there. He leaves out the last part of his rehearsed speech. Remember back in verse 19 when he said, just treat me as one of your hired servants. Why doesn't he say that now? Because he's already been fully received and there's no need to earn back his father's love. That would almost be an insult to grace. So this son, in his remorse, simply entrusts himself to the mercy of the father. And that's all that any sinner ever needs to do. And it starts with the heart change. Verse 22, and this is extraordinary. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Notice the father acts immediately, quickly. Taku in the Greek, speedily, without delay. Quickly, get the robe. The robe was a symbol of the father's dignity. Get the ring. That was a symbol of the father's authority. Give him shoes. The father gives him responsibility because servants did not wear shoes. The father gives his dignity, his authority, his responsibility to the son and extends him full sonship. Now this is a picture of how grace triumphs over sin in direct opposition against all religion that says you have to work your way to God. God lavishes the contrite sinner, doesn't he? And now once the son has been restored to the father, verse 23, the father says, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Why? For this son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. And they began to celebrate. That's what we read in verse 7. A party when the sheep was found. And there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Verse 10. A party when the coin was found. And there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So now the greatest celebration erupts when the son is found. Here is this awesome celebration to honor the shameful father and to recognize the shameful son. To the Pharisees, this is fiction. But this is truth. This is God in Christ and the sinner being reconciled. And this celebration of God's joy in the redemption of sinners will go on forever. Now the elder son comes on the scene. Now it's his turn to join the father and embrace the brother, right? Tragically, celebrating and honoring his father is the farthest thing from his mind. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to them, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. Jesus just identified this character for us. He is the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. They were outraged with Christ, remember, for embracing sinners? And their actions proved that they had no relationship with God. And that is exactly this elder son. Inside his heart, he resents, even hates his father. He too had no relationship with his father. But outwardly, he is the righteous one. He is the moral one. He is the good 
son. But all the while he has lived estranged from his father in his heart. It's where it all begins and where it all ends, in the heart. So this resentful hypocrite would not go into the celebration. Too full of pride, like the Pharisees, he had no category for grace. But contrast, once again, the loving father. It says his father came out and pleaded with him. So picture this now. This father is beside himself with joy in the moment, the guest of honor. And he hears his older son throwing his temper tantrum. And he has to leave the celebration. Um, excuse me a minute. I'll be back. I have to tend to someone important. But the son answered his father, look. Wow. You talk about shameful. Is that the way you address your father? Look, all these years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. Hmm, do you think? Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not brother, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Whiny, entitled, legalist. I didn't get a party. Maybe because you didn't give your father anything to rejoice about. But once again, notice the father's compassion. This indignant son Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me and all of mine is yours. Here the father is endearing because eight times in the chapter, the Greek word for son is used, but the father chooses the term technon, child, child, my boy. You've always been with me. It's always been yours. You only had to come and have a relationship with me. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive and he was lost, but he's found. God in heaven has to celebrate. This is his greatest joy. Since the fall of man, it's always been about celebrating the return of the lost. In this story, we see two different kinds of sinners and everyone in between, all of us, with one gracious father who loves us all. A father who pleads with the world to come back to him. A father who makes himself known but doesn't impose his will. This father is our Lord. And what makes God rejoice when 10,000 sinners are saved? No, God doesn't hold his joy. God's heavenly celebration erupts when one sinner repents and comes to him with remorse. In these three parables, Jesus paints with words the beautiful picture of God's amazing grace and overflowing joy. And when you recognize your need for grace and return your heart to the Lord, you bring the greatest joy known to God. So why not make the choice the younger son made when he came to his senses and decide today to return to the Father Make an assessment regarding eternal life. Ask Jesus to be your savior. And let heaven erupt in joy as your celebration begins. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for continuing to seek the lost. 
You do not treat us as our sins deserve or deal harshly with us. Instead, in your unfailing love and with your amazing grace, you remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And in your joy, you celebrate our return as long as we are open to you, we open our hearts to you, God, and seek your forgiveness. God, even in all your power and glory, you are still like a father to your children, tender and compassionate to those who fear you. Thank you, God, for never giving up on us. And Father, for all those who have heard your word today, open their minds. Give them the ears to hear and the hearts to truly receive your message of redemption this day. In Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.